of videoing the mass now. You have to bless all the cameras, I think, especially this one doesn't fall off, especially when I jump around in the pulpit, right? Back in 1987, I was preparing to begin my novitiate as a Franciscan, and so before entering the, uh, into novitiate, I decided to take a personal pilgrimage through Italy. So I was uh, 20 years old, I grabbed a backpack, jumped on a plane, I went to Italy, and I went to Rome for, a, for some time, then I went to Assisi and prayed at the tomb of St. Francis and this and that. And then I decided, that's it, I'm going to Padua, to the tomb of St. Anthony of Padua. And while on the train, I realized I would be arriving in Padua in time for the feast of St. Anthony. So it was a great grace to be there for his feast day, which was quite incredible. Um, but when I got, got there, I went to the Capuchin Church, with about a 20-minute walk from the, uh, where St. Anthony is buried. And I asked for a place to stay there. And when I got there, I met the sacristan, who was such a nice guy. And he took me in. They gave me a room to stay at the friary. And, and that's when I met... St. Leopold Mandich. Now, he had already been dead a good 45 years at that point. <laughs> However, I felt like I truly met him. Uh, he was, uh, had just been canonized in 1983. So he was only four years canonized when I arrived at his shrine. And so there was a lot of joy around this new uh, saint of the church. And I began to read a lot about him, and I really came to feel like he was a real friend of mine interceding for me from heaven. Uh, a truly beautiful saint in so many ways. He was born in what would be present-day Croatia, in Dalmatia, uh, in 1866. And he never really grew too tall. Uh, he stopped growing around 4'11", 4'10". He was a really short guy, so he's one of the short saints. There's a number of short saints, but that's the story for another day. <laughs> so, um, and, and in his heart, he would spend a lot of time in prayer as a young boy and, uh, and was very bothered throughout his younger life in the struggles between the Eastern and Western churches, growing up in an area that was very much affected by the split between the Eastern church and the Latin church. He felt like the Lord wanted him to be a missionary to try to bring the two churches back together and to evangelize his own land. Now, he joined the Franciscans in hopes that he would be a missionary. He went to seminary, he got ordained, and he was a friar now, and he asked to go to the missions, and they said, no. <laughs> it's like, wait, but God wants this of me. And like, well, you're, you're very frail in your health, and you won't be able to be, sustain the missions. It's tough out there, and you're not good with languages. And uh, so he was, never really got to go to the missions. About 12 years, he bumped, bumped around a bit here and there, going to this friar, that friar, doing different tasks. Eventually, he was sent to Padua. Again, only 20 minutes walk from the Basilica of St. Anthony. And there, he was basically assigned to help the students. And then he was asked to be the confessor. And that began his ministry. His mission field was not to be back home and working with the, trying to bring the churches together, his mission was really to be a missionary to souls, a missionary into the heart of every single person who came to him. His job was not to reconcile the two churches, but his mission began to reconcile souls with God, that he would impart to souls the true peace of Christ Jesus. Day after day, hour after hour, 12 hours a day, a stream of people would line up to go to confession to him. And he had, much like St. Padre Pio, the gift of being able to read souls. And so he would help them make their good confessions. And when the line would let up a little bit, he would just kneel down and begin to pray, primarily to Our Lady. He loved the Blessed Mother so much, and he spent so much time praying to her that he would just tell souls, go to Our Lady, pray to Our Lady. <laughs> and so... Um, he was quite the missionary to those who are far from the Lord. Look at the gospel today. Our Lord says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. And that really was the work of St. Leopold, was to impart the peace of God. Peace that came through the forgiveness of sins. 
peace that came through the absolving of sins, peace that came through knowing that these souls were reconciled to God, peace that came from knowing their sins were forgiven them and that they were free to now live as children of God, free of the guilt and the blame and the shame that was laying upon their shoulders. For 40 years, 40 years, Every day, 12 hours a day, Leopold, little Leopold, sat in that confessional and just imparted the mercy of God. He spent so much time in the confessional absolving sins that after his death and he was buried, when they dug up his body 30 years later to move it to the church, they found that his body was corrupt except his right hand from here to here. His right arm was incorrupt because of all the absolutions he had given, all the sins he had forgiven with the beauty of that hand. Now, Americans, we just would have buried the arm with the body, not Italians. They have to put it in a jar in a glass window. <laughs> so when you visit his shrine, you pass by and you see Leopold's hand sticking out of a glass jar. <laughs> you know, a little creepy. <laughs> you know, like uh, the Adams Family thing, you know, the hand that comes out. <laughs> but anyway, that's a story for another day. Not making fun, just kind of quoting it. You know, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but it's Italian. <laughs> You know, he was not known for being a very tough confessor. When people would come to confession to him, he was so gentle with them and so kind. He would give out very light penances. And other priests said something to him one day. You know, like a, they said, what are you doing? You know, these are so hardened sinners. We, you, you know, you're giving out these light penances. And he said, you know, if I get called on this before God on the day of my judgment, I'm going to say to Jesus, it's your fault. You're the one who is so merciful. I'm just following your example. You're the one who set the bad example. And then he said, uh, and then I tell Jesus, well, at least I haven't been so foolish as to die for sinful people yet. <laughs> so kind of jokingly saying that the reason why he was so merciful is because Jesus set that example. And he was just following the example of Jesus. Now, he did give out light penances. But what nobody knew is that he would spend the night sleeping very little, two to four hours. And the time he wasn't sleeping, he was praying for all those people that had come to confession to him. He would do their penances for them. So if someone had really serious offenses, he would give them a light penance. And then he would do their penance for them because he wanted them to experience God's gentleness. But he took it upon himself. So much like Christ. And he would pray also for those who were going to get ready to come to confession to him. He had many, many miracles that he worked, uh, numerous, not even too many to recount how many miracles he worked and would just tell people he'd pray for them and then it would happen. They would be healed. They would be risen from the dead. They would be saved from death. I mean, just amazing the amount of his miracles. It was just tremendous. This little saint, <laughs> this little guy uh, who was truly a powerhouse and a giant of God's mercy and God's goodness. He had prophesied that the Second World War, when it was coming, that uh, the friary would be bombed and that three things would remain. The tabernacle would be untouched, the statue of Our Lady, and his confessional. And when Padua was bombed, the only thing left standing of his friary was his cell, or I should say, yeah, well, he heard confessions, the statue of Our Lady and the tabernacle just as he had prophesied in the Second World War. He died in 1942 after some sick, sickness and uh, gave his life over to the Lord and happily entered into the joy of the kingdom of heaven. Not too long ago, when Pope Francis decreed the year of mercy, he held up two patrons for the year of mercy when he was calling everyone to go to confession that year and that beautiful year of mercy that Pope Francis proclaimed. He had two patrons of the year of mercy. One was St. Padre Pio and the other... St. Leopold, and he had their bodies brought to the Vatican uh, as, a, as a way for people to make pilgrimage and to ask their intercessions so that be, they would be able to make good confessions. Today, perhaps the sacrament that is most ignored is the sacrament of confession. Such a beautiful sacrament we have, the sacrament of God's mercy, the place where God always distributes his peace, the place where we hear those beautiful words, your sins I absolve you of your sins. Your sins are forgiven. You go in peace. The true peace of God comes through the forgiveness of our sins. 
So may St. Leopold today intercede for us, this little guy who was truly a giant of God's mercy. May he intercede for us that we may not only uh, seek out God's mercy in our lives, but obtain mercy for others, and that we might draw other people to the beautiful sacrament of God's mercy in the holy sacrament of confession. May God bless you and Mary keep you.